And my mum would find me as a kid just lying on my stomach watching ants and I would have like pockets of slugs and my mum absolutely hated it. For wildlife conservation and for ecotourism, this pandemic has been an absolute killer. Had it not been for ecotourism, we would not have mountain gorillas in the wild now. You can be sitting in your living room with a headset on and you can have a guide taking you on a virtual live tour of a rainforest, of a savannah. You this is the Green On The Go podcast, where we talk about keeping travel sustainable. And for this episode, I got to speak to wildlife and ecotourism specialist, Catherine Capon. So hi, Catherine, welcome to the Green On The Go podcast. Hi, India, thanks so much for having me. Looking forward oh, to <laughs> It's so good to have you on, honestly. I'm so excited to chat to you because um, you come from a really, really fascinating background. So, so let's start with that. If you could tell us a little bit about yourself and your background um, within ecotourism. Yeah, absolutely. So my um, background probably, I mean, I don't necessarily have a job title um, as such, um, but I call myself an ecotourism advocate. Um, and it's something that I guess has always been inside me, but developed at a quite a specific um, time in my career. So um, I studied zoology at university. Um, always have had a kind of passion interest um, in the natural world, even from a very young age. I grew up in London, um, where obviously the kind of outdoor spaces to explore are, are fairly limited. But you know, my mum would find me as a kid just lying on my stomach watching ants and I would have like pockets of slugs and my mum absolutely hated it. But I've just always had that real fascination with the natural world and probably spent a, a good proportion of my time in London trying to escape lunch <laughs> and get away and, and see different places. Um, so yeah, I studied zoology um, at university and then you know, sitting in lecture theatres, learning about these animals was was interesting, but I really wanted to go see, touch, smell, um, all of these things that I was learning about. So the opportunity came up um, at university to go and study bats in Honduras in the cloud forests and just jumped at the chance. It was the first time that I had um, undergone an expedition of that kind where I uh, lived in the rainforest for three months, slept in a hammock, cooked my dinner every night on a fire that I started myself. It was very much like real Bear Grylls style um, living. And I guess it was that experience, which really was, I guess, the clincher for me in the fact that I just came back from that experience with a completely different perspective on how the, how important the natural world is, how threatened it is um how vulnerable it is and how I wanted to kind of dedicate my career and my time to saving places like that and also making sure that people have the opportunity to go and visit them before it's too late so came back from that experience wanted to communicate about these places entered the world of um uh, producing tv so worked at the bbc straight after my last exam at university worked at a couple of independent production companies um at that point in time and then obviously the social media world then kicked off and I realized that actually um, potentially social media is a better vessel than, than even broadcast television in some respects to get people passionate and excited about the natural world because rather than sitting there and watching a documentary and feeling impassioned and motivated about a cause but then maybe um, sort of making a cup of tea or making dinner and then kind of forgetting about it if you're on social media you can click a button and donate straight away you can go and investigate how to travel to that place and it's all on your phone it's all on one device um so then social media filmmaking and kind of content campaigns around ecotourism and conservation became became my passion and became my kind of um place of, of work so i've promoted ecotourism now in in a multitude of different ways whether that's broadcast tv whether that's um social media campaigning whether that's taking people on expeditions to actually take them out there um to some quite kind of hostile um to some people it feels like quite hostile um places um and just showing them that you know actually it's accessible it's doable and just having those moments of pure awe when you're watching wildlife um, and just seeing the magic and the majesty that we have on this planet and, and bringing home, hopefully, ambassadors for, for our planet. Yeah, I, I think that's really interesting that you were saying how you realised the, the, the positive power of social media to, to yeah. spread your message, because I think social media can have a bit of a bad rep. And I know within tourism, it, it has done in, in recent years because 
you know, you take a beautiful picture, everybody wants to go to that place, gets inundated with tourists. Um, but it's really, really great to see you talking about it from the other side, where actually it's a great tool to communicate what's going on in the world with, with you know, your followers, people that are, are following your journey, and how that can educate people and how it's very, it's much easier to sort of, like you say, donate all those kind of things. So yeah, so yeah I mean, it has, like you said, it has a double edged kind of sort of social media um, side of things, but definitely, yeah, having that access to being inspired and immediately being able to donate a dollar, look for how to book that trip, having that kind of accessibility on social media. And also the fact of, you know, we are, fortunate to have been able to travel and visit lots of places but actually social media brings travel to people that may not ever be able to travel to those places so you might not have ever seen a rhino or been on a rhino safari but you might see a devastating image of a rhino that has you know rhino carcass that has been um poached and have it has its hole missing and that can really impact you and um, and it, it kind of inspire you to become an ambassador or to do something about that course even though you may have never been there so I think that's the power of social media to bring places to people that um, maybe haven't even been able to visit themselves physically yet. Yeah. And have you found that social media has become very important over the last year? Obviously, we've been living in a pandemic. None of us have been able to travel, but there's still these issues going on in the world. And have you found that it's been a very really great way to communicate to people what is still going on, despite the fact that you can't visit these places, despite the fact that you can't help in person what's been sort of going on within um wildlife conservation during the pandemic and has social media helped to keep these funds going yeah i mean the pandemic has been horrific for ecotourism and i guess we can we can maybe touch in more depth on that um later on but yeah i mean for for conservation for wildlife conservation and for ecotourism this pandemic has been an absolute killer um but there have been some really great things that have come out especially like you say on social media where um i work quite closely with a um a conservationist in borneo who works with sun bears and he now does um kind of weekly uh speeches and tours and actually takes people around he's managed i don't know how he's managed to do it um with the technology but he's managed to be able to live stream from the rainforest of borneo and actually do some really interesting and informative talks about the ecosystem, about sun bears, about the threats to sun bears. Um, so people have been had to be more ingenuitive, if you like, with technology and storytelling. Um, and also, like I said earlier, there's this there's this part of, you know, not all not everyone will able, be able to visit those uh, amazing rainforests in Borneo um, because physically they can't or financially they can't. Um, so there has been this um, kind of new uh, development of, of taking people to these places physically and even in virtual reality now with headsets and things like that and doing kind of 3D filming. Um, I think we're only at the cusp of, of taking people to these places virtually, which is which is really exciting. And hopefully it inspires more people to travel and travel responsibly. And it's sort of that try before you buy um, type experience where you can see and look around you and feel what it's like to be in a rainforest in Borneo and you know see and hear all the sounds of the rainforest before you actually go and that hopefully that will be the kind of clincher to get people to um to travel more responsibly and to um try ecotourism if they have yeah been. absolutely now and I know that pre-covid you were running a project to encourage holiday makers to visit wildlife hotspots during their vacations um so what what was the importance of this why did you want to push this and say to people if you're going on holiday visit a wildlife hotspot it's going to do x y and z yeah so it was a, an interesting journey how I came to that um specific project so I guess one of the things that I had always felt quite passionately about as an environmentalist is that with campaigning and working in sustainability you're often saying to people don't do this do less of this um which can feel a bit sometimes a bit uh, preachy and also you're sort of it feels sometimes like you're trying to tell people to live their life in a, a less exciting way if you like than maybe they felt like they were previously because we all know that what we do has an impact on the planet 
Um, and if you're always telling people to do less of something or stop doing something, it, it, it has a it doesn't necessarily have a very positive um, impact. So what I loved about ecotourism was the fact that people naturally feel very excited and passionate about travel anyway. People love their annual vacations. Um, they love going on holiday. They spend a huge watch of their annual salary on that travel. Um, so naturally we feel positive about travel. And it's just kind of skewing how we travel in a slightly different way which then has a really positive impact on the planet so rather than telling someone not to do something you're saying go ahead do it but do it in a slightly different way um you know rather than going on a you know a cruise ship which might be really environmentally friendly kind of mass tourism with loads of food waste um lots of contaminants going in the water probably very poor humanitarian um policies in place for the workers on that ship or whatever or even these kind of big consumptive all-inclusive resorts and hotels it's just go to that destination go and travel go and see um the things that you've always wanted to see definitely don't not travel but do it in a different way where you know that actually it's having a positive impact so make sure that you check that local people are being employed that the money that you're spending as a tourist is actually going back and having a positive impact on the local community um, make sure that you uh, make an effort to uh, research and, and kind of become acclimatized to the culture of the place that you're going to so you don't you know offend people or do something appropriate in a in a place that you're visiting but also from the wildlife perspective I guess the biggest thing is that the money that you spend as a tourist um, helps to protect those species for the future so you go to this country and you spend money and you um, are paying to go and see a gorilla in the wild for example or you're going to go on safari and see the big five those local people in that area are getting money or hopefully if it's done responsibly they'll be receiving money from your trip and your travel um, therefore they realize hang on a minute these species are really important to keep alive because people are coming to spend a lot of money to see them because they don't have them in their own country um, they want to come and see our forests they want to come and see our coral reefs and actually rather than um, kind of feeding our families or, or, or making money from um, ways that are damaging to the environment actually protecting those species is better in the long term for our community um, so they then become real guardians of those species and, and protect them. And I think that's why um, ecotourism is so powerful and why I was so um, excited to start that campaign. I, I picked kind of 12 places and I did 12 destinations in the 12 months of the year to show people, obviously, species are better sighted at different times of the year. Um, so hopefully gave people a kind of overview of where the best time of year to see different species is. Um, and actually how to do it for a similar budget to that you would spend on maybe going to a kind of all inclusive hotel somewhere and in a similar time frame, you know, so a kind of one to two week um, time period, because, yes, it would be lovely to take people, you know, traveling through South America for months on end. But we know that, well, pre COVID, maybe maybe slightly different post COVID, but people were very restrict restricted to their holidays and, and would only have a certain budget in a certain time. So that was the kind of idea of the project and it started off um, mainly writing articles for kind of travel press and, and travel publications and then kind of picked up a bit of pace so we started making some films um, yeah and then from there it's, it's kind of escalated to, to speeches and like I said taking people out to some of these places obviously again pre-covid so um, it was a great project and um, yeah I would love to get back to it as soon as, as, yeah. soon as we're over. <laughs> I think that's what you make such a fascinating point because Sometimes you do hear the sort of school of thought that leave the wildlife alone, don't go looking at it, just let it be. You get on with your holiday, get let the wildlife get on with their lives. But which is true to, to an extent, but I think it's very interesting you make this point that these animals are worth more alive than dead because things like poaching is such an issue and I know um speaking to Vicky from Earth Changers she was telling me that poaching became more of an issue during the pandemic because there was less rangers out there protecting the wildlife um and obviously the money wasn't coming in from tourists seeing these animals in the wild so people were trying to make money you know killing them and poaching yeah, them yeah yeah um so it's 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 evidence that what you're saying is so so true but I guess 
what is the important the important part is don't just go and choose a tour guide that you just find a flyer for and you go yeah that'll do you need to research that the tour that you go on so you make sure that it's a sustainable one and that you're going on one where they really have the animals welfare at the top of their list totally and I think just ask ask questions before like if you're um, on a tour or you're about to start a tour ask all the questions that you would kind of want to know the right answers for like are you local you know are you have you been brought up in this area are you being employed locally by the um the ecotourism company that's that's employing you um ask those questions because often you know and you, you all kind of have that instinct of what feels right and feels appropriate I mean we there's a very fine balance and you touched on it with regards to um some places should be kept you know completely untouched when it comes to like the mountain gorillas for example in Uganda they did ecotourism again pre-covid very very well and had it not been for ecotourism we would not have mountain gorillas in the wild now. Um, so ecotourism has saved the mountain gorillas. There are um, there are groups of gorillas in those mountains that no one goes near. Um, so there are areas where they don't take tourists into that are completely um, protected. Those gorillas live out their lives and probably never have um, much contact with, with human beings at all. Um, and that's that's great because those, you know, those areas, those pockets are completely untouched. They are habituated groups then that are used to having um, tourists come and see. And obviously you get a one hour time slot to see those gorillas. Um, you have to have all the medical tests to check that you don't have any um, infectious diseases because obviously our DNA is incredibly close to those gorillas. Um, you... I, I believe actually you didn't have to wear masks but I believe from now on you will have to wear masks when you go on the treks and see the gorillas but those gorillas those specific groups that are used to tourists they have now seen tourists every day of their lives and they are used to them we have very strong boundaries of how close you can get to them etc so in Uganda ecotourism has been done incredibly well however now that we don't have um ecotourism as it was pre-covid all of a sudden, like you just said, the money that normally would come in through tourists isn't paying those local guides. It's not paying the, the lodge cooks and the cleaners and all everyone else is employed by the ecotourism sector. So all of a sudden, those local people who depend on that money to feed their families um, have to start cutting down rainforest, do slash and burn agriculture, to start farming, to do subsistence farming, because that's the only other option they have available to them to feed their families. They're encroaching the gorilla's habitat. Some of them are going out to hunt um, endangered species because it's the only protein and meat, because all of a sudden they can't go and buy the protein and meat because they're not employed anymore. Um, so all of these huge impacts, and actually it'll be really interesting to see how gorilla ecotourism rolls out in the next kind of um two to ten I guess years from this pandemic and how if we can recover and I hope that we can yeah I guess it's 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 all about plowing the money back into the right places and hopefully you know we've got to keep our fingers crossed but hopefully people are going to look at the way that they travel differently when travel does open up but do you have any concerns uh, about people going back into travel tra you know traveling and and holidaying and thinking that they're just gonna go crazy because they haven't been able to do it for such a long time and the impact that this might have um on wildlife conservation so it's, yeah do you have any concerns with travel going going back to to the new normal yeah I guess um, so obviously I've just explained there why ecotourism is so great for wildlife conservation and how that type of travel is, is brilliant and I hope that there's more of that in the future. Um, obviously COVID has had a, an impact on um, you know carbon emissions because of um, air travel being halted and, and that probably has had some great consequences actually. Um, I guess there's a few things that I hope that people will do differently when they go back to traveling um, post COVID. And I think one is that I believe and I hope that there may be a shift in the fact that I think people may take fewer longer holidays. And the reason being is that um, air travel will probably be more expensive as we as we get back into travel, because obviously the airline companies are having to make up for the money that they've lost. 
Um, but also now having worked successfully remotely, I believe that many people will be able to spend longer stints of time traveling, exploring different countries in different regions and still being able to work remotely. So I think and I hope that people might go on um, fewer, longer vacations, which I think will be really good for the planet because also not only obviously will that have an impact on the um, carbon emissions from the um, aviation from that but also I believe that people when they spend more time in one location just get more get deeper get a, um, a deeper kind of sense and a tie with that place and learn more about the local customs and local ecosystem the species that they're they're seeing so that's one way that I hope um people people start to travel again um but yeah I, and also I suppose that Covid taught us um in many cases that actually being in nature and being outside and um kind of exploring your local area I think probably had a, a positive impact on many people's lives I know I for one you know when we were in lockdown spent a significant amount of time outdoors either swimming or walking or hiking around um, the local area and I mean I personally have always had a, an affinity to being outside and, and nature but I know that people that hadn't necessarily had that kind of discovered that during Covid um, and I hope that that then transpires to how you then travel rather than staying in a hotel and not leaving the, the kind of uh, resort that you might be in, actually going out and, and swimming and exploring and hiking and, and doing more things whilst you're abroad. So I guess those two things are the, are the ways that I would love to see travel changing when we go back to travel. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's so true. The more time you spend outside in nature, the more you have a you're, you're, you're more likely to have an increased, I guess, um, kind of respect for, for the place that you're in and the more likely you're going to want to protect it as well. Whereas if you're sat in an all-inclusive hotel, you're blissfully unaware what's going on outside those walls. You yeah. have no idea what's going on um, in the reality of the country that you're in. But if you do start exploring it will open people's eyes up to what's going on in the world and so hopefully they'll start traveling in a more sustainable way and I, I think you know it's, it's such a great point to make and really interesting as well that you bring up that whole fact that people now will be working from home so they can work anywhere they can work remotely they'll be able to take these longer vacations and in turn they'll hopefully be able to invest more in the places that they're going to both both obviously financially but also at their time as well and I think yes. it's and it's getting that emotional thing. Thing. yeah totally. definitely absolutely so would you is there any places that you would recommend people to go obviously once travel starts opening up and they're thinking right I can I can safely book a trip now and I want to do something that is going to have a positive impact on the environment and, and I'm really interested in wildlife conservation are there any key places that you recommend people look into going uh, when things open up yeah absolutely well I mean there are there are obviously the 12 um that I kind of previously um explored and and those include and, and my personal favorite Madagascar Madagascar is an island that to me is the pinnacle of um ecotourism possibility it's a incredibly beautiful island has um coral reefs has uh, forests, mountains, deserts, um, really diverse ecosystem, incredibly interesting culture. Um, and from a kind of zoologist's perspective, is just there's just nowhere else like it on the planet. I mean, there are species there that have evolved that exist nowhere else on the planet. You can't find lemurs um, in the wilds anywhere else on the planet apart from in Madagascar. Um, they are baobab trees that literally look like they're from a Disney cartoon and beautiful trees that, again, you mainly just find in Madagascar um, and pr pristine beautiful white beaches of the Indian Ocean similar that you would get in the Seychelles or the Maldives but people don't necessarily naturally um, think of Madagascar as a destination and it's one that I always push and promote um, because there is such an opportunity there because again when we were talking about how animals being worth more alive than dead there are 113 different species of lemur in Madagascar right now, from the injuries, which are these beautiful, the biggest that are alive today, 
um, beautiful species, black and white, lovely faces, kind of look like they're like the giant panda, if you like, of Madagascar, um, down to um, mouse lemurs who are, you know, the smallest primates that live on the planet, absolutely tiny, really hard to spot, but when you do, they're just glorious. Um, the diversity of, of lemur species there, and, and not just lemurs, but amphibians and um, and uh, reptiles that you get in Madagascar and bird life as well. Um, you just find nowhere else on the planet. But people don't necessarily think of it. I think if you say the word Madagascar, people think of a you know the animated movies, but don't necessarily think of it as a destination. But there's so much opportunity there for ecotourism and, and of those 113 lemur species um, scientists predict that in 25 years time maybe even less now because of covid every single one of those lemur species will be extinct which is wow, it's shocking just shocking and they are primates they're some of our closest living relatives you know if we can't save primates what are the hopes of saving other species um but again, like we were saying, if people visit Madagascar, book these local guides as, as tours, all of a sudden, as tour guides, sorry, all of a sudden they won't be um, killing the lemurs to eat them. They won't be slash and burn, you know, cutting down the pristine um, primary rainforests for agriculture because that's the way they need to feed their families. Madagascar is the 10th poorest country on the planet. So these people, they're not doing it because they're baddies or you know they don't respect nature they're literally doing it to survive but if we give them alternative ways um to earn a living and survive through ecotourism then those lemurs and those amazing species that um have evolved on that island um stand a chance of survival so madagascar is probably the one that i would recommend but obviously it varies from different people's budgets different people's um some people don't like flying long distances. Some people have um, less time to travel abroad. But there are some amazing places in Europe. There are amazing places in Britain um, to do ecotourism really well. I am the trustee of the European Nature Trust. Um, we have a reserve called Alladale, Alladale Wilderness Reserve in Scotland, two hours north of Inverness. An amazing um, ecotourism um, venture up there where they're rewilding the area. Obviously, Scotland has been kind of decimated by sheep farming. We no longer have the big carnivores um, that would, like the wolves, that would have kept the deer in check. The um, previously kind of glorious forests um, of Scotland have all but diminished and at Elladale they are replanting them, bringing species back and it feels like stepping back in time when you go there. Um, there's an amazing lodge there and it's a different kind of um, pay levels of stay, you know, you can stay in the more basic accommodation or you can stay in some luxury accommodation there. Um, so it really varies on depending on where people want to travel and what their budgets are and the time spans. But from, from Scotland to Madagascar, there are there are opportunities for ecotourism almost everywhere. Yeah. And, and, and out of curiosity, is is the reasons is there a reason why Madagascar hasn't been a, a a place that people automatically go to? Because it sounds incredible. You've sold it to me. <laughs> Madagascar <laughs> is now at the top of my list. Um, so is it because it is so expensive to get there? There's a couple of reasons. One, um, annoyingly, there are no direct flights in the UK, um, which puts some people off. So obviously having to stop via Paris or stopping via another route puts some people off um, travelling there because some people like to fly direct and don't want to kind of stop at multiple airports. Um, so that would be one reason. The second reason is that there are no five star accommodation um, options there at the moment. Um, the highest level is, is like a kind of four star. And again, some people that are really seeking luxury or really wanting that kind of luxury or comfort travel don't currently have an option there. I hope that that changes um, in the years to come. But at the moment, it's definitely not terrible accommodation, but it is more basic than maybe you get in places like the Seychelles and the Maldives and the, the kind of um, other Indian Ocean destinations. And I guess the third reason is... Um, it's a big island you know they actually call it another continent um and traveling around the island itself can be tricky because the infrastructure isn't amazing so the roads um especially in certain times of the year where there's heavy rains can be almost impassable traveling around madagascar has its challenges and if you um are one of those people that is very much um you know like to get from a to b in a certain time frame it can be it can be physically uh you know, slightly worrying to, to, to travel to, in that way. I am, you know, I love the adventure of it and I like the idea of getting stuck in a car and having to like dig ourselves out and get to, to get to a different destination and, you know, maybe thinking it's going to take a two hour 
a two hour drive and then ending up being like a, a whole day to get there. But if you have that flexibility and that kind of attitude of being more of an, an adventure destination than a kind of, um, yeah, more like a luxury holiday, then Madagascar definitely is a place for you. Um, and to me, the stories and the adventures and the kind of tales that I have to tell from my times in Madagascar definitely outweigh those kind of slight frustrations of, oh, with this car stuck again or our flight, our internal flights being delayed by three hours or, you know. Um, so that, I think that's the reason why it's not at the moment, but I really hope that changes. Yeah, but I guess, you know, we're a society that just is so used to convenience isn't it? and actually oh, yeah convenience that, and control yeah yeah that's and that's the issue but if you go to somewhere like that knowing that it's part of the experience and almost buying into the fact that that is part of it you know yeah. it, you you can you, you don't your expectations change so you Hopefully. learn to enjoy those those moments which you might otherwise see as see as frustrating um, now, I know that you're a mum of two, so I'd love to talk to you about how um, if you've got any tips on getting little ones excited about wildlife conservation and, you know, taking little ones on holiday with you, how you can get them, you know, fascinated with the world around them in a positive way. Yeah, totally. It's actually really funny because um, so I have a coming up to four-year-old and a, a coming up to one-year-old um and I guess my challenge is not pushing it on them too much too young because obviously it's my life's passion um and animals and uh, you know evolution and species and like all of that kind of stuff that I'm itching to kind of really teach and and go and show and and do all this I guess I, I have the kind of um, worry that I'm going to go too far and almost do it too much and then, then they're going to be put off for life. You know how sometimes your parents really push stuff on you and then you kind of repel? Like, re- um, yeah. <laughs> to an extent, so I, I had that with dancing. <laughs> so I almost have the other side that I'm trying not to do it too much and trying to let them actually explore it from themselves. Um, but it is quite interesting because you know all the books that we have around the house are kind of wildlife we have lots of um world maps on the wall with you know different species of where you find them and and even though I haven't I've tried you know I've really really tried not to spend hours you know testing him on different species and and doing all that it was interesting because um I picked him up from nursery the other day and they had um like miniature toys of um different species on the side and and someone from nursery had said oh uh, that's a there's a rhino and um Enzo turned around and went no it's not it's a tapir <laughs> so yeah. obviously it's going in a little bit and he yeah. he he's learning his species but when I fell pregnant the first time I really had this thing of like it's not going to change me I'm going to sling the babies on the backpack and I'll carry on um you know traveling and exploring and taking them to all these places obviously two things happen once one that I became a mother and realized actually that <laughs> it doesn't happen like that um and as much as you want to be able to carry on life and sling them in a backpack and you know carry on traveling in that way it just doesn't work because they are you know very um babies and, and young kids are very much about routine and have to have naps at certain times if you don't do that it kind of ruins everything so that kind of spontaneity of traveling um has changed we've done kind of mini travel um trips with him uh so far so we went to Skoma Island in Wales to see the puffins which he absolutely loved but we've kept things quite small scale um at the moment um but definitely as he gets older and and also like we were saying about the cost of some of these trips like going on safari in you know in Africa isn't a cheap holiday and I want to make sure that when we start to do those things with him he remembers it and it's at the right time of his life so yeah, it's it's a bit of an interesting journey because I definitely had that. My kids are going to grow up as you know conservationists and ambassadors for the planet, and then actually realizing as I became a mother that I mustn't. Um, I have to let them ex- discover it and fall in love with it for themselves, and I can't be that pushy mum that <laughs> that tries to force it on them. Yeah, but it, it sounds like you know just by having the books um, and taking them on trips you're going on to these areas are a little bit more wilder. They don't have to be obviously right out in the desert or super, super hostile places. But like you say, 
taking them on a boat trip to an island where there's puffins or something like that it opens yeah. their eyes up to what else is going on in the world um and sparks an interest totally and even with our garden we moved into a house um uh two years ago now and our garden was completely devoid of anything it was literally a monoculture lawn with nothing on it which for me just killed me anyway um but it's been a re- especially through the lockdown it's been a really nice project to start um adding some diversity to our garden you know we've got a little wild patch where we've planted bee bombs with like wildflowers and that is his thing because his world is quite small you know we've seen the whole world and our eyes are big and we we know what it's like to be in these different biomes but for him our garden almost and our the beaches that where we live they're his world and watching him rock pooling watching him um you know finding bugs with his bug collecting stuff in the garden and planting um wildflowers for the bees and the butterflies in our garden that's his world and that's his way that I'm hoping he'll slowly build to loving the natural world yeah absolutely oh definitely and I think I think yeah that all makes total sense just get kids excited about what's going on you have to push anything on it just get them excited um so have you got any sort of projects that you're hoping to work on in the future or things that you're sort of seeing going on and you're thinking actually this needs a little bit more focus and I need to draw people's attention to, to these areas yeah so um well two two kind of main things um one is virtual reality I touched on it before but virtual reality is something that I'm getting increasingly excited about and something that I'm investing more of my time and energy into discovering um how we can bring travel to people that are unable to travel. Um, I think that we are in a situation where, imagine back in 1994, nine, before the internet, um, we're sort of there in the virtual world. We're we're at the cusp of um, people having headsets almost, you know, in every in every living room. Um, and for me, rather than, I mean, I'm not definitely one for, for gaming, um, but to me, it's that potential of getting people on a headset and educating them, learning about different species, spaces, species, ecosystems, and taking them on tours. Um, and even with the technology now, there's the opportunity to have live guides, right, which I think is so fascinating. You can be sitting in your living room in Folkestone, um, with a headset on and you can have a guide taking you on a virtual live tour of a rainforest of a savannah you can go on a virtual safari um, and learn about yeah the the species and the ecosystem literally from your living room um, that space gets me really excited because there's so much potential there to inspire people to travel to places for example had you have had a virtual tour of Madagascar and seen the spectacles that you could see, like the Avenue of the Baobabs or the rainforest in the southeast and seen and heard the sound through, you know, your earphones and headset of the injury calling each other, um, that might just touch a few hearts and minds to go and actually visit and book that travel. So virtual reality, the metaverse, that whole space in the non-gaming, the very much the um, the more content creation space, that, that is something that I'm investing a lot more time and effort and energy into um, for the potential. And then still Madagascar. Um, <laughs> I'm still, uh, in fact, it's been postponed several times. We are on the cusp of making a documentary about the Alima Action Plan, um, which is a scientific document that was created by um, a very eminent primatologist, Russell Mittermeier. Um, about how we can save the lemurs from extinction and how to raise the 10 million um, US dollars needed in order to save them. So we have been due to make a documentary on that that's been pushed back and back and back um, due to COVID. So hopefully when travel restrictions lift, they'll be the two things that I'll spend a bit more time on. Yeah, and and that virtual reality um, project that you're talking about, it totally makes sense because... I think the fear of the unknown is what stops people from booking some of these places that aren't necessarily, you know, on the tourist map or, or something. But if if they can experience it first a little bit and almost have a little bit of hand holding first, like you say, it might encourage them to to book. And okay. it's, it's it's a it's a really interesting um, thing. And you know, obviously, 
we're all so used to talking on screens we're, we're talking yeah. on a screen right now so you know over the last year that has escalated so quickly and I can see this whole VR thing going as well and it's really interesting to see how that works within obviously the travel industry but but ecotourism especially yeah and actually one of the things like you were saying about that kind of um taking the kind of fear out of traveling to somewhere unknown but also the fact that you can develop a relationship with the guide that you're going to have in the physical world before you even travel you know you might think oh my god landing into um you know I'm going to land in uh, Uganda. I've never been to Africa before. I have heard sort of scary stories about traveling to Africa and blah, blah. But actually, if you have had, had a virtual reality tour with a guide and you've built a relationship and you've chatted to them and you've asked them questions about the gorillas and you all of a sudden become very much more relaxed and calm about the, the idea of traveling to somewhere unknown because you already know someone there. You've already built that relationship and relationship building across the virtual reality space is something that I think is going to change people's travel. And, and I always am trying to overcome people's fear of traveling to unknown destinations because oftentimes you're going to have so much more exciting adventures experiences things that you'll be telling your grandkids and you know for years to come about those places that you felt a bit more nervous about traveling but it wasn't you know Tenerife <laughs> yeah they're the ones that you come back with all the stories I yeah. can totally vouch for that and you know I think it is it's true there's been times when I've gone to a little bit more remote places and I've wanted to book a local tour sustainable tour but because they're very local and it's not run by a big shiny company I've been a bit scared about you know handing money over beforehand yeah. and booking beforehand thinking is this legit um, and every single time it has been I, but you know you're always second guessing and and wondering because they haven't got it's not a brand that you know when actually they're the you need to be looking at those local companies because they're the ones that are going to be giving you the real deal. So I think, yeah, it's really, really interesting to see how. And actually the app that we're working on, um, we call, we're calling it like Uber meets Lonely Planet. And what we're aiming to do is that those guides will have a star rating. So the community will self-regulate. So, for example, you were saying about being worried about handing over money or having a bad experience. They will then have one star regard versus someone who has you know done an amazing tour or very legitimate organization will have five stars so that kind of self-regulation I mean many of the kind of big travel brands use that self-regulation but we're really hoping to um, bring that into the virtual reality world where yeah um, people will become much more confident because of the star rating and also then the guides are you know compelled to do a better job uh, for the audience because they know that it's going to impact their their rating so yeah yeah absolutely such a great idea um well it's been amazing chatting to you you, you have such an energy for what you do you're such a passion and it just shines through and um, oh, so if you. people are interested to keep following what you're doing and find out more where can they find you yeah so i say probably first stop instagram and um, so my handle is katherine capon um or youtube i've got a youtube channel which has got some of my older um documentaries on there and kind of short form content which hopefully we'll have some more coming <laughs> coming soon um but yeah i'd say instagram and and youtube will be the two places that um if people want to find out more get involved or hopefully come on a trip one day um those are the places where you could look for me and we have to do a trip ourselves we have to organize a trip in here yeah definitely <laughs> i'm so I want you to take me to Madagascar. <laughs> you can do that, for sure. Definitely. <laughs> oh, well, thanks so much. It's been really, really fascinating talking to you. And um, yeah, I'm going to be looking out for, for the projects you've got coming up too. Brilliant. Yeah. Take care, India. Thank you so much. You're driving around the reserve to make sure. And then someone comes towards you and you know there's a vehicle coming and you just don't know, you know, who it is or what it is. And you, know, you live your life in kind of constant adrenaline, basically.